it was like in contrast to all of the movement that we had been doing. And then suddenly we were still and like there were there was this this like vibration between all of us. And people were sharing out of like a far more vulnerable place than if we had just like walked down the street and walked in and sat down. That was really incredible. The 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 the, the Quaker Podcast. Story, spirit, sound. I'm Georgia Sparling. And I'm John Watts. And I've got a question for you, John. All right. What are some reasons that people participate in a Quaker meeting? Oh, that's a that's a good question. I'm I'm sure it's different for everybody, but I imagine, you know, folks are coming for regular community, for spiritual refreshment. I'm sure some folks come out of curiosity and and for many other reasons. Um, for me, my Quaker meeting holds this work that we're doing right now on the podcast under its care. So attending meeting for me is particularly grounding and nurturing as we continue to grow as an organization and try out new things. Okay, those are great answers. But how do you actually develop community? And how do you hear from the Spirit? And what if your meeting is good, but you feel like something is still missing? Yeah, um, questions that I'm sure all Quakers have asked themselves at some point. And there are questions that don't necessarily have a tried and true answer. But for today's episode, we're going to meet a group of millennial friends who tried something new, something that actually looks a lot like how the early Christians met in small gatherings and people's homes. And it's really been working for them and actually for their meeting at large. Yeah. Tell me more about the group. Yeah, so they're part of the Portland Friends Meeting in Portland, Maine, and they have established this community where they felt the spirit move in powerful ways, which has made some waves amongst older friends in their community. Ooh, waves. All right. Uh, I'm interested <laughs> to hear more. <laughs> um, you know, intergenerational dynamics in Quaker meetings, as in most places, can be complex. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Um, today, we're going to see how those dynamics went down. And I'll take you inside the millennials meeting and explore how and why they felt this burst of spiritual growth. I think it's simple yet profound and also has some applications for meetings beyond Portland. Yeah, that sounds like a rich exploration. You know, since Quakers believe in continuing revelation, we're not always as tied to form as we might be. I mean, we are human, but I like to think of Quakerism as an ongoing experiment. Like, how do we organize ourselves around what has life and where the spirit is moving instead of expecting it to work the other way around? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So in this episode, first, we're going to learn what this meeting is all about. And then in the second half, we'll sit in on their gathering and experience some of it firsthand. So let's get started. All right, let's go. My name is Maggie Fiore. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a member of Portland Friends Meeting. Maggie worked with Quaker youth for many years. She's an artist and she's a member of a midweek worship group called the Millennials. That's millennial with a Z and it's a mashup of the words millennial and Gen Z. It's a pretty silly name. <laughs> I feel like that's always the thing right off the bat that I'm like, Oh, I feel like I need to explain that it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but so it is a midweek worship group um, that is specifically for the millennials like age cohort um, or generation. Yeah, we started as a potluck group and then pretty immediately, like after our first potluck, we were like, oh, we want to worship together. At the time, there were two married couples in the group who shared an apartment and they invited everyone over for a midweek worship meeting. And it felt incredible. And so we just kept doing it, and we've had worship pretty much almost every Wednesday, whether on Zoom or in person, since 2019, I think. We were, one, hungry for something really transformative on Wednesday nights and on Sundays. And we you know, carved out that space to find that. And then we were bringing that same like hunger and 
freshness and, um, you know, eagerness for like real spiritual power and, and experimentation to Sunday worship. And people were like, whoa, where is this coming from? They got mixed responses from members of the Portland Friends meeting. I know in any Quaker community, there's always some tension about like, well, why does there have to be a YAF program, a Young Adult Friends program? Like, why, why does there have to be a special group for young adults? But then at the same time, it's like, well, why aren't there enough young adults? Why aren't, why, why? <laughs> and those two things are linked. <laughs> That's not to say that everyone in the Portland Friends meeting objected to the millennials, but there there was also reactions of like surprise and confusion and down to like outright concern and and like disagreement about whether or not this group should exist, which I think a lot of it stemmed more from just not knowing why we were gathering for worship on Wednesday nights and why it was important to us that it be for a specific age group. I myself was a little surprised by this reaction, so I got in touch with another member of the Portland Friends meeting to better understand it. My name is Dorothy Grinnell, and I've been a member at Portland Friends meeting since 1999. Dorothy is in her 80s and has held a number of roles within the meeting. Yes, I've been clerk of the meeting, and I've served on Youth Religious Education, Finance and Stewardship, Welcoming, Nominating, a few others. <laughs> Dorothy says that there was some tension over the millennial group. Some Portland friends asked, why do the millennials need their own meeting? And why aren't older people invited? And the answer came back, well, they have some concerns of their own that they would like to discuss among themselves. Dorothy says there was a fear that the millennials might leave altogether. But the opposite happened. The millennials and young people of that age were coming to Sunday worship regularly and participating very forcefully in business meeting and explaining their views. And we were talking to each other. And it really was a feeling like, oh, these people are taking hold. I now don't feel there's anything to be afraid of of having that group involved because it does is a first step. And reaching out to those people to say, won't you join us in a committee? We need your viewpoint. We can't discuss where to go if we don't know what your needs are. The older friends have made a concerted effort to get to know the younger friends. And Dorothy believes that having the millennial group has given newer people a connection to the community that keeps them coming back. The whole meeting sees that the meeting is growing and growing with younger people so that those of us who are in our 80s and 70s can step back and let others come forward. But we are talking to each other. It feels good to me. All it really needed for was for us to like honestly and lovingly tell our story. And then people were like, oh, of course. <laughs> I think the young adults in Portland Friends Meeting have been able to show up with so much more authenticity and like spiritual courage in Portland Friends Meeting than we would have been if we didn't worship together regularly and has like connected us to Quakerism in such a deeper way that um, I think we have a lot to teach our meeting <laughs> about worship um, and about what's so fresh and exciting and enlivening about Quakerism. And, and so my, my hope is just that like friends are willing to listen and to be changed by that. So what does this millennial meeting actually look like and how does it work? It's rooted around silence, but we as a group were really clear right from the beginning that silence wasn't the thing. We really leave the door open for if people are led to bring any sort of light structure. 
So like queries or, you know, going around and checking in on our spiritual lives. There's a real range. Like sometimes we have like something as structured as like dance worship where we were doing something really different, but it was still centered around that listening and waiting to be led. Afterward, the group discusses worship during a time they call afterthoughts. So it's like a common Quaker term in a lot of meetings, and it means a different thing in lots of places. But for us, it meant having an intimate and open-ended conversation about what worship was like for you. And then it will sometimes go into, like, questions about, like, was I supposed to share this message? You know, questions of faithfulness, like, was I faithful to what I was feeling in worship? Sometimes it's, like, workshopping worship and, like, workshopping how to center. So people will be like, man, I was so uh, distracted or, you know, my back hurt. Like, what do I do in worship when I feel, you know, depressed or anxious? And, like, helping each other with those tools. And we also have tea. The tea is really important. Often it's sleepy time tea. Sometimes we drink other kinds of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Crucial. <laughs> now, let's circle back to that dance meeting. You know I had to learn more about that. We had like maybe 30 minutes of dancing um, in my living room. <laughs> uh, it was tight. Um, we are also like masked. It was <laughs> it's, it's so weird to think about now. We, yeah, we danced to like a lot of different kinds of music. So, like, you can stay really still the whole time if you're not feeling called to move. Um, or, like, you can just wiggle or you can, like, <laughs> flail all, all over the place. And I feel like the most incredible thing ended up being that it prepared us for a depth of silent worship. That was maybe one of the most gathered worships I've ever been a part of because it made the stillness really mean something where it was like in contrast to all of the movement that we had been doing. And then suddenly we were still and like, there were, there was this, this like vibration between all of us and people were sharing out of like a far more vulnerable place than if we had just like walked down the street and walked in and sat down. That was really incredible. So since y'all been doing this for a while now, like what are some ways that you feel like you've connected better to spirit that you've grown in your own spiritual life? Oh man. <laughs> uh, overall, it's given me a place to workshop what faithfulness looks like in worship specifically. I feel like this group gave me a place to, or gave all of us really a place to strengthen our ability to center and listen and then like test if what we were hearing was from spirit. Cause like we would mess up all the time. We would like give mes messages that we were like, actually I don't really think that was from spirit. And we could like talk that through and we weren't nervous about that happening because there was so much trust built up in a group so small and with so much like commonality of life experience. Maggie was an original member of the Millennials Meeting, and although she is often in care of worship for the group, the week that I visited, I met Vicki Anderson, who was taking on that role for the first time. Vicki and I arrived about the same time at the apartment where the group was meeting for that week. It was a three-story Victorian, a mile or so from downtown Portland. Vicki was very gracious to let me in, even though they had no idea who I was, um, and also sat down with me for a short interview. So Vicki said that they found a real spiritual home among this group. First off, I'll have you say your name and kind of where we are. Um, yeah. I'm Vicki. I use they, them pronouns. And uh, we're in our friend Jenna and Hannah's space while we prepare for worship. How long have you been attending this meeting? Um, probably about a year and a half or so. I've been looking for a spiritual practice that is inclusive and open and this space has been um, very 
uh, engaging and welcoming for me. So as far as this meeting that you said, first off, this is your first time kind of, well, not leading, but what do you, uh, caretaking? So yeah. yeah. Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So for me, it means, um, holding the space for the people who are coming and trying to, um, engage spiritually in the idea of being welcoming, giving as much spiritual support as possible. Do you remember your first time coming to this particular meeting? Yeah. So I remember just this feeling of being very welcomed and feeling like um, a really strong presence of spirit within the group and a mutual seeking and a mutual longing that felt very real to me. Mm -hmm. In this space, I've always felt like a very strong presence of spirit. And I've, I've had experiences where I have felt as though there was another presence in the room or that the presence of spirit was really palpable um, in a way that's really indescribable, you know, without getting too like mystical about it. Um, mystical. <laughs> you know, I've definitely felt a palpable, palpable presence of the spirit within this group. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that something that you knew you were looking for? I didn't initially know exactly what I was looking for. I was I was mostly seeking a spiritual community that was going to be open and accepting of me um, in terms of, you know, my queer identity. And um, I had sort of gone through some things through some other spiritual practices where I didn't feel accepted, I didn't feel welcomed. And this was just so clearly where I belonged. Um, and so once... I felt comfortable and more at ease with the people around me. I felt more able to engage in and explore the leadings of the spirit. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. We're going to take a short break and then we'll actually go to this meeting, at least part of it, and we'll experience it for ourselves. So if you can find somewhere quiet to sit, listen to this ad, and then we'll be right back. Hello, dear listener. It's John here, and I wanted to hop on and tell you about something exciting we are starting in 2024. By now, you've probably gotten used to a short piece in this mid-episode break telling the story of a listener and asking you to become a monthly supporter of the podcast. I've heard from a surprising number of listeners that it's actually one of their favorite segments on the show. And that's pretty cool, considering that it's basically an ad. So that's not going away. But we aren't the only ones doing good work that needs support in the Quaker world, not by a long shot. In in fact, you may know of an organization or a project that could use more visibility, and we want to help. After just one season, our audience now averages around 3,500 listeners per month, and that number is growing. We have found those listeners to be thoughtful and engaged folks. Of course, you should know, since you're one of them. So here's what I'm building up to. If you know of an organization or a project that could use more visibility and support and could maybe benefit from some media creation and storytelling expertise, we want to help. This space, right here, in the middle of the episode, could be dedicated to telling the story of your project, and that could have a major impact. Just reach out to us at quakerpodcast.com slash contact and let us know about your idea. Okay, back to the show. Welcome back. So before we jump in, let me set the scene. It's a cool July evening. There's a slight chill in the air, but we're seated inside, of course, in a small, cozy living room, illuminated by the day's fading light. It's a Wednesday, and today the meeting is pretty small. There are four of us seated around a coffee table, myself, Vicki, Maggie, and Nick. Actually, Nick is lying on the floor with a blanket as we begin worship. He'd come in saying that he'd had a rough day. He'd gotten angry earlier, arguing with someone on the internet, and it had left him both rattled and disconsolate. 
I introduced myself a little nervous about whipping out a microphone in this quiet space, but glad to be sitting down after a busy and stressful day. I was eager to close my eyes and to sit quietly. So let's take a few seconds to be still. I'll play some music, and if you're able, spend a few moments entering into a more centered space. Now we're going to sit in on part of the meeting. Early on during worship, Vicki shared a brief poem that they wrote, and they kindly allowed me to share that with you today. I am reaching as the tender hand that waits is reaching beyond words, beyond the stars, with cosmic spacious love. The group mostly sat in silence for their hour-long meeting and then spent time discussing worship. You'll hear me passing the microphone around as they share, and we're going to begin by hearing from Vicki, followed by some dialogue between them and Maggie. That little snippet that I, like, that I gave, what was it, like, what was that for you? Mm. If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, no, yeah. I guess what, it felt like an invocation, Mm. which is, like, a word I've only, like, started to really understand, but just, like, like it it felt like it belonged at the beginning of worship where, where it was. Right. Because you were saying, you were, like, putting words to what, we're doing Mm -hmm. just like reaching out our hands to god and it was also just beautiful like i was like that's a poem (laughs) and i think that's also where my brain like like, that's why i started thinking about like man i would love to put that into type maggie said that lately she's been trying to discern what to do with the urge to turn these words into visual art i think it's just like this gut reaction of like i want that to be shareable with more than just this room at this one time Mm. And that was the part of, like, what was going on in worship for me where I was like, am I just, like, thinking of, like, the next interesting thing that I should do? Or is this actually a leading? I don't know. It's, like, kind of a, it's kind of like a new sprout, I guess. Um, I don't know if, like, me openly, me, like, verbally discerning about, like, a small leading I'm having is, like, a message. (laughs) I don't know. So you said that you were feeling like discerning, like yeah. out loud may not be oh, a yeah. message, but like, and sometimes I feel like discerning out loud, like we can hold that space for you or we can hold that space for each other. And like, and it is a space and a place for us to like be able to work out those things out loud with a community. I know, sometimes I feel like I'm, like, trying too hard to use my discernment muscles <laughs> because I, like, have so many opinions about, like, yeah, like, especially on Sundays, like, opinions about, like, like, oh, that message was just fine or, like, that message didn't really have much discernment <laughs> in it. Like, they just kind of, like, like, I feel like the better I get at the practice of, like, saying like is this a message for worship or is this just my thoughts so when i give a message on sunday i am like shaking and sweating and like having a whole time and that doesn't really happen in this space and it's just interesting then saying that i my i don't have any physical cues (laughs) to tell me (laughs) like if something's a message or not um i was thinking um georgia had asked me earlier and I was looking for this word and I was like you know we have this like we have this space where we're all together and it's a community and I was like what is the word that like differentiates this from like the greater meeting Mm. and 
it came to me during worship. I was like, oh, it's intimacy. Mm -hmm. Um, We have that intimacy. And so I think that, you know, that we have a sense of each other that feels more comfortable and more safe. Mm -hmm. Not to say that it's not safe, like in another setting, but like, because we're all in this place together in like a more, you know, I'm going to say intimate again. Um, but you know what I mean? You, yeah. You, you no, picking totally. up what I'm putting down? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think I was thinking about that in worship too. I was just like, wow, I've grown a lot in the last like four years of worshiping on Wednesdays. Because um, usually I just think about how other people have grown a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've, learned, I've learned a lot in terms of like what recognizing what feels like more spirit led than more self led. And like, I've been given that space to do that here. And, and like, and it's all received really lovingly. And then there's also like, I felt like at times when I haven't been quite on the mark, there has been pushback in a way that was really gentle and loving. Mm -hmm. And, and so I've been able to, like you said, have that like slight more discernment muscle about where, something feels like spirit and something feels more like me and my ego. And like, I'm not perfect at that. I still haven't gotten to that point of like, you know, perfect spiritual discernment. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, like you said, growth, you know, and and this has been a place to grow for me, for sure. It's, um, it's been, it's been pretty, pretty awesome so far. (laughs) I don't know why I said so far. That was weird. (laughs) One thing I really appreciated about this group and that I think really helps to foster the spiritual atmosphere that they've developed is how they made each other feel welcomed and listened to. So we haven't heard from Nick yet. He's the one who I mentioned had had a tough day, but here's Vicki addressing him. Do you mind me asking like what was coming up for you? I mean, I was sort of surprised because I felt like I was doing relatively okay but I'm often weepy I don't know like I I had the thought that you know after being well I was I did come in angry because I was arguing online so it kind of feels like like being a kid and you're having a tantrum and then mom hugs you and then you cry oh, and you it gets oh, released oh. I feel really glad that like you feel like this is that space for you. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Then it was my turn. Oh, yeah. I didn't ask how how were things for you. (laughs) Has anything interesting come up for you or... Honestly, I was just kind of reliving my very stressful day and trying to figure out, like, solve problems in my head. Uh (laughs) And I was like, oh. But it was really nice to be with people after just kind of, like, doing stuff on my own today. Mm -hmm. So I find it's always, like, things seem smaller once you're actually with people versus Mm -hmm. just sitting and stewing in your head and, you know. (laughs) So I was grateful to be here. I find that worship in this space and in the greater meeting um, is like a place of like spiritual refreshment and like just a a place to have a quiet quietness um, that I don't get in the rest of my week. And so this this is like this is a place of rest for me. So, yeah. Yeah. I feel really grateful for tonight but uh i think i'm gonna have to call it a Mm -hmm. night so probably should wrap up oh my goodness look at the hour thanks for letting me record it i appreciate that (laughs) you know i was thinking about this meeting and how easy it might have been for the millennials, realizing how good a thing they had amongst themselves, to decide that their midweek meeting was enough for them. They had worship and spiritual connection and community, 
but instead they brought their spiritual excitement back to the larger meeting. They kept going on Sundays. They started attending discussions about finances, joining committees, getting to know older members in their meeting. They didn't isolate themselves, and the older people in their meeting responded in kind. Both groups opened themselves up to something new, and what they found is their community could not be anything other than transformed. Thank you for listening, and thank you to Maggie, Vicki, Nick, and Dorothy of Portland Friends Meeting. Find a link to the transcript, reflect on our discussion questions, and more at quakerpodcast.com. Today's episode was reported and produced by me, Georgia Sparling. John Watts wrote and performed the music. Studio D mixed the episode. And your moment of Quaker Zen was read by Grace Gonklevsky. The Quaker Podcast is a part of The Quaker Project, a Quaker media organization whose focus is on lifting up voices of spiritual courage and giving Quakers a platform in 21st century media. If you want to support our work, please consider becoming a monthly supporter. Every contribution expands our capacity to tell Quaker stories in a fresh way, and it makes this project sustainable. And now for your moment of Quaker Zen. Francis Howgill, 1663. The Lord of heaven and earth we found to be near at hand, and as we waited upon him in pure silence, our minds out of all things, his heavenly presence appeared in our assemblies, when there was no language, tongue, nor speech from any creature. The kingdom of heaven did gather us and catch us all as in a net and his heavenly power at one time drew many hundreds to land. We came to know a place to stand in and what to wait in, and the Lord appeared daily to us, to our astonishment, amazement, and great admiration, insomuch that we often said one unto another with great joy of heart, What, is the kingdom of God come to be with men? Sign up for daily or weekly Quaker wisdom to accompany you on your spiritual path. Just go to dailyquaker.com. That's dailyquaker.com.